You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Greetings to all of you listening around the world, and a warm welcome as we bring you another edition of the Answers for the Family radio show. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and if you're a regular listener, thank you for joining us once again. Now, if this is your first time, please make yourself comfortable as we bring you Answers for the Family. Now, each week, this show will address issues such as family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, lasting health, and so much more. Having over 30 years experience working with families in crisis, I am grateful to have met and worked with some of the top professionals in many of the helping fields and skilled authors who are working to make this world a better place for all of us. Now, you all can do me a big favor. Please check out some of our past shows at AnswersForTheFamily.com to hear some informative and entertaining guests, as well as dynamic co-hosts discuss ways for you and your family to become happier, healthier, and more at peace. Now, I'm also looking for some show ambassadors who will forward at least one of our shows to your social media group or to someone you know who can benefit from a particular subject. I want you to know that I truly appreciate it, and this is just another way that we can make a positive difference in the lives of others. And I can also tell you that this will be a subject that we all either have gone through or we know somebody who has. So if uh, once this gets started, if you know somebody, uh, give them a call, uh, send them a message, tell them that this is a subject that is well worth them listening to. Because our topic today, which is a title of our guest's new book, New Rules of Divorce, 12 Secrets to Protecting Your Wealth, Health, and Your Happiness. Now, marriage as we know it in America has changed. And so too has divorce. For instance, women are out earning men. Published in Time Magazine, as of 2010, the median full-time salary of young women was 8% higher than those of their male peers in 147 of the 150 biggest cities in the United States. Now, fathers are also winning custody battles. Same-sex marriage is now law. But for the most part, people's understanding of what to expect in a divorce is based on decades old TV shows and dated advice from past what is believed to be conventional wisdom and may not necessarily be correct anymore. Now, in this environment, many expect to walk away from a broken marriage, losing their mind or breaking the bank. Well, our guest, Jacqueline Newman, is the managing partner of the divorce law firm of Berkman, Botker, Newman, and Sheen, LLP, in New York City. And she specializes in complex, high net worth matrimonial cases and also in negotiating prenuptial agreements. Her practice consists of litigation, collaborative law, and mediation. Jacqueline appears regularly as an expert commentator for various television and radio shows, as well as print publications such as The New York Times, The New York Post, Business Insider, Time, USA Today, and Glamour. Now, these act- activities and her reputation for ethical standards and professional ability among her fellow lawyers have earned her the highest rating, the AV peer review rated by Martindale Hubble. Now, Ms. Newman was also selected for inclusion in the Thomson Reuters New York Metro Super Lawyers Top 50 Women Attorneys since 2013 and has been included in editions of New York City's Best Lawyers since 2016. So with all of that, Jacqueline, welcome to Answers for the Family. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I want you to know it's my pleasure and uh I don't know if you were uh, if you were told, but besides the fact of hosting this show and being involved quite a bit in working with at risk youth, I'm also a licensed detective. So and I work internationally. So uh, this is a topic that I've seen now for the last 30 years. And and as I said in the introduction, I've seen a lot of change, as I'm sure that you have as well. So before we talk a little bit about the book, tell us a little bit about some of the changes that you've seen and how you feel that it has either improved or hindered the system. So I think one of the biggest changes, and I do talk about this a lot in the book, is really about custody. And so back in the day, 
we were a situation where, you know, dad would get every other weekend and Wednesday night dinners. And that was kind of what happened. And that's just not the case anymore. Now we're much more in a situation where you're looking at fathers who want to be more involved in the daily child rearing for their children and are doing it. And they're really, you know, we're looking at more 50-50 situations with 50-50 access. You know, judges are really encouraging it. So you're seeing this shift. And I think it's great personally. And I think it's a, you know, I think it's a very welcome thing. And I think that the children are benefiting from it. And, and so are both spouses. Um, and, you know, it also the other reason it helps, and this is another shift that you're seeing, is that there are many more women in the workplace than there ever had been before. And being that men are, you know, involving themselves more so in the child rearing, it ultimately frees a lot of women up to be in the workforce, which therefore ultimately also changes a lot of the dynamics when we're dealing with spousal support and things like that, because we're now in a situation where women are becoming much less financially dependent on men. So you're kind of seeing this whole shift happen, um, which again, you know, I think it's fantastic. And it's definitely, um, you know, it's definitely made divorce on some level easier and some level harder. Well, in, in dealing with, with many clients as you have, um, what would you say is the biggest mistake that you see clients make uh, before they contact you? You know, I think one of the biggest mistakes that people make is really allowing their emotions to dictate and take over reason. And while I don't blame anyone for that, because look, divorce is a very, very difficult thing. It's obviously emotionally charged. So I'm not, this isn't a blame game. But what it is, is it's acknowledging the fact that what happens is people find out things, people are hurt, people are angry, and they lash out. And either they say things they shouldn't say, or they do things they shouldn't do. And it ultimately creates this environment that is so incredibly toxic that makes it very hard often to be able to settle your case and move forward in a productive way. And so by the time they come into my office, they've either, you know, blasted things on social media or they've said things to the children they shouldn't have or whatever it is they did. And then it sets us up in a situation for what a case that could have been pretty simple to resolve is now going to be that much harder because of the fact that everyone's so much more angry. And well, I'm glad that you mentioned the part as it relates to things that they've said to the children, because that's a, a huge sort of a, a pet peeve or problem that I've had that I've seen uh, being on the investigation side of this. Uh, share a little bit about some of the ways in which you've approached these in such a way, maybe it's in mediation or just dealing with your client on how they can make sure that they keep a focus on the fact that what happens now is going to have a huge emotional effect on the children. You know, so what I do is sometimes I'll say to my clients, I said, you know, I, I want you to fast forward, especially when they have young children. I'll say, okay, you have a five-year-old daughter. I want you to fast forward 20 years from now. And how do you want her to describe her parents' divorce? Do you want her to basically say, oh my God, my parents hated each other and they you know, went after it and I couldn't be in the same room with them. And it was so difficult for me to even be at a, you know, and at back to school, you know, events because my mom was pulling me in one way, my dad was pulling me the other way, it was awful. Or do you want them to say, you know what? I know my parents had issues but they didn't involve me in it. And ultimately all I knew is I got, you know, sometimes I got two Christmases and I got to spend time with both my parents and they were happier people. And really when you think about it, that's what you're aiming for. You're aiming for your children to be able to describe their parents' divorce as something that did not destroy them, that did not ultimately set for them, you know, what it looks like to be in a completely dysfunctional relationship. It really taught them, they, you know, you want a kid to say, you know what, I know my mom and dad were angry at each other, but they cared about me too much to basically pull me into this or to involve me in it in any way. And so that's what I say to my clients. Like, how do you want them to talk about it? You know, do you want them to be in therapy for the rest of their lives, sitting there and talking about how horrible it was for them because they were asked to choose parents or they were, you know, alienated or whatever it might be? You know, that that's what you need to think about. So don't think about just the moment of where you are right now, which again, easier said than done. And I understand that, but I need you to fast forward because at the end of the day, your job as a parent is to raise your child to be as healthy and happy as possible. And if you can do something that you know is going to ultimately, I mean, if you do something that you know is not going to achieve that end goal, then you need to stop yourself and you need to think like, what is my end goal? My end goal is for my children to be happy. I want everybody out there that's listening. Okay. If you know somebody that is going through a divorce, okay, go to our site, go to answersforthefamily.com. Pull up this interview, mark that part, that statement that you just heard, and play that for them. Okay, That can be one of the greatest things that you can do for any friend or family member that you have that is in that position because you're going to help them help their family tree. 
from now on. I mean, it, it's going to establish something that I think will be so beneficial for everybody in their life. So please, if you do nothing else, play that part again, because that part is huge. And, and thank you for that, Jacqueline. Uh, now, uh, I know that uh, mediation has, um, has been more involved. Share a little bit about mediation, uh, how it has grown, you know, what percentages are now uh, being, uh, cases are being heard uh, through having just one attorney. And share some of the benefits and or pitfalls, if you believe there are, there are any, on families choosing that. So let, I just want to kind of be clear. Let me define what mediation is so people are understand it. So mediation is where you work with one person who's a neutral to help the two parties be able to resolve their conflict. That said, very often, at least when I do mediation, I usually do recommend very strongly that they have outside attorneys that really are being able to look at things from their vantage point. Um, so, you know, I often will say, I want you to, you know, go talk to your attorney about that. Because again, when I'm acting as the mediator, I'm neutral. And so I can't, you know, if one person says something that's so ridiculous, it's not really my job to sit and say, no, you know, he or she shouldn't get 100% of the assets because I'm a neutral person. That said, I think it's very important for them to have outside attorneys that are looking at this only from their vantage point to be able to say, you know what? No, no, no. She doesn't get 100% of the assets because you did X, Y, Z. That's not how this works. So that's like one of the things about mediation. I think mediation is a great process choice. It's, you know, it's self-selecting if it works for you. And when I say works for you, I mean, you can, you know, one of the reasons that it does fail at times is because there's such a great power imbalance. Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, I've had mediation where I've acted as a mediator and I've had it, the attorneys actually be in the room to kind of kind of counterbalance that power imbalance. Um, or, you know, I've, I've been the attorney going into a mediation room. So I think that, you know, there are ways to deal with it. I wouldn't say if there's, you know, if we have one person that's so much more dominant than the other in the relationship, that means mediation is out. I wouldn't say that, but it does make it more challenging. The other thing about mediation is it's very, very important that everyone is present in the room. And when I say that, I mean, you know, you, you obviously, you want to get out of your marriage. That's why you're going through this. And it's very easy to just want to say yes to everything just because you want to get out of that room and you want to end this. But I can't explain how much of a mistake that is. And I really, you know, again, I talk about this a lot in the book about how you need to be careful when you're making these kind of agreements. Because I think of like a mediated agreement, like it's like a building. And so, you know, you make one agreement and you kind of build on top of each other. These are the bricks of the agreement. And then let's say you agree to all these things. And then you go and you see your attorney who says, you can't agree to that. That makes no sense. How would you basically say you're going to keep the house when you completely don't have enough support and money to do that? Like that makes no sense. And then you go back to the mediation and you say, okay, I spoke to my attorney and I looked at this and I realized I couldn't say that. And then you pull that brick out and now the whole house crumbles because every, everything is usually built on something else. So it's really, really important for you to not just yes to people to death. And it's very, very important, you know, if you are going to have attorneys to use your attorneys throughout the process so you don't be in that situation where you're now at the end, you think you're done, and then you realize you were making deals that really no sense at all. So I think, you know, again, it's a great process. I think it's very respectful. It's generally the least expensive process. And I think that people that walk out of it are probably in a much better situation than they would be if they, I mean, definitely in a better situation than they But I think that it's really, you know, it's a nice way to do things. And I always tell people, you know, you could try it once. The worst thing happens is you see a week, you know, the one hour of your life and one hour of the mediator's fees. But if you are able to move forward, even if you resolve custody, let's say, and you have to litigate finances, okay, but you still saved yourself, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees and therapy bills. Well, and and I agree, and I'm glad that you you explained it so that people understand it. And I think another benefit, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that that I've seen in these situations is is where uh, when one party or the other starts saying things that uh, that are ridiculous, at least I've heard where a mediator explains the way in which the system works. So it, it isn't taking a side, but it's when one gets, says, well, you know, I'm going to do this, this, this and go, well, let me explain how the system works. And there's a computation that's going to happen and this is going to happen. And so by explaining that, I think sometimes it um, it keeps people from going off the rails in such a way that sometimes uh, I think at least coming closer to reality. Does that sound about right? Yeah, no, it does. I mean, the thing about mediation and any type you're in of agreement is that, you know, it's very hard to take responsibility for your agreements. And that's another thing you need to be sure that you're ready to do. 
So, you know, a lot of people, I've had a lot of people that have gone through court and one of the reasons they do is they say, you know what, at the end of the day, I need to feel like I fought and I need the judge to say to me, this is what has to happen. You know, and I can accept it if it comes from the judge because, you know, at the end of the day, I did everything I could as opposed to mediation or collaborative law or, you know, or just regular agreements. You know, someone has to say, you know what, I accepted that as my is my decision. And basically that is my agreement. And that takes, you know, that takes a lot. And some people don't feel they have that, but I think that it, you know, I think it is a really important thing to own your, own your decisions. And I, again, I think that it just helps you moving forward to be able to co-parent with this person and move forward when you basically have entered into an actual agreement together, as opposed to having the judge, you know, shove a decision down your throat. Uh, I know in your book, you talk a lot about some of the misconceptions. So um, what would you say two of the biggest misconceptions that people have about divorce or even about divorce attorneys? Well, I think one of the biggest misconceptions about divorce is itself. I think that people think that you have to see the inside of a courtroom to get divorced. And, you know, we were just talking about mediation as another way to do it. But a lot of times you'll have people that will say, you know, I'm just too scared to go to court, so therefore I don't want to get divorced. And, you know, it's not every case is not the war of the roses. I mean, there are cases that many cases um, that resolve themselves, you know, just sitting in an attorney's office or in a mediation room or collaborative law or anything like that. But I think that I really would want your listeners and everyone to know that, you know, there are ways to do, you know, to move forward in the divorce process that are much more respectful and, you know, much more civilized than what a court system may be. That's one thing. I mean, the other thing I think that people are, you know, usually under the impression is that if something's in someone's name, they think it's theirs. So very often I'll have situations where I have a client come in and we'll talk about, you know, what do you have in assets? And they'll say, you know, they'll explain everything they have. They'll say, oh, but all that's in my name. And I say, well, I, I hear you on that, but that's still a marital asset. And people are usually floored by that and so incredibly upset because they feel that they've scrimped and saved and sacrificed to be able to put all this money into an account that's their name, their money and their name. And then when they learn that their spouse who, you know, may, they may see as a censor still gets half of that or whatever the percentage is based on, you know, what state you're in, it's devastating. And so I really, you know, kind of tell people all the time, like, yeah, you know, as much as you're scrimping and saving and have all that money sitting in your, you know, in your underwear drawer, just so you know, at the end of the day, half of that could be your spouse's. Well, and I think you bring up a great point because that would also hold true to properties or businesses or anything else, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So that's one of the things like, I mean, New York is not a titled state. Most states are not. And so, and obviously if you have listeners that are outside of, you know, outside of New York, they should say uh, their attorney specifically. But in most situations, it's my understanding that, yeah, title does not dictate. So also in the book, you, you write that many women tend to suffer more financial hardship than the men after the divorce. Um, explain a little bit about that and why and, and have we gotten any better in that area? I think we have gotten better. Um, I mean, I think it still exists. I mean, look, there is there is a wage gap. I mean, it exists. So let's not pretend it doesn't. But that said, I do see us moving in the right direction. Absolutely. And one of the reasons that women um, – you know, generally do worse after a divorce is because of the fact that, you know, more often than not, even though it's definitely changing, but it's still, it's still occurring that women are out of the workplace more so than men. Even when women are working, you know, more often than not, if the kid gets a call from the school nurse, odds are the mother's going home as opposed to the father. So, I mean, all of that still exists. And so, you know, I, I joke with my friends, you know, I'm, I am running a law firm and I have two young children and I joke that during the children's years, you're almost like treading water on some level in your career because, you know, you really are balancing two full-time jobs. That all said, um, so upon a divorce, more often than not, again, women are going to be in a situation where they're just not going to have the same earning capacity that men will. And so while, you know, assets are being divided, but when they're, and they may have received some spousal support, um, and when I say spousal support, that means alimony, maintenance, et cetera. At the end of the day, you're still not probably going to be able to earn the same capacity as your ma- as your ex spouse. I mean, you may be able to, and I don't want to poo poo it because, again, you know, and maybe because I, you know, work in New York City and I deal in the high net worth space, I have a ton of women who out earn their husbands. So as much as I, I'm, you know, I do say that in the book, and women do generally get hurt more than men as a whole. I will tell you that at least in my, you know, the people that I'm working with more often than not. I'm not seeing it to the same degree that I would say is probably the national average. Well, and and I'm actually glad you brought that part up because I know in the introduction I mentioned uh, 
as when I was doing some of my own research, but I mentioned about the uh, 147 of the of the 150 biggest cities uh, that there was an eight percent higher uh, salary for young women uh, in the workforce. Uh, there's still uh, women are still at about 80 percent if uh, if you take in the whole nation. You know, so uh, you know, 80 percent of what uh, men's salaries are. So yes, I and I didn't want. Uh, after I read that, I thought, you know, I may ha- might have to adjust that or at least uh, address it a little more that although things are changing in some of the major cities, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has changed across the board. So thank you for touching on that. Um, now, you also mentioned that that you are also a mom. So how, how does that impact your work as an attorney? You know, I think that it actually makes me stronger. And it's interesting because before I had children, as much as I would, you know, fight for my clients, obviously, and as much as I would, you know, especially when I'm representing a parent, you know, I felt very strongly about it. And I actually used to have this rule that I never wanted to see a picture of the kids when I was going through the litigation because I, it was too hard for me to know, you know, when I hear these stories and stuff, it was just too hard. I'd always say, show me a picture at the end of the case. Like, I don't want to see it in the beginning. And, you know, but again, when I was, before I had kids, I don't think I truly, truly, truly understood as much of the pain that a parent feels when their child's not sleeping next to them, you know, under their roof every night. And I just don't think I appreciated, you know, when I would have clients that would say, you know, the idea of not seeing their child wake up on their birthday morning or not seeing their child on Christmas morning or whatever, all these firsts. I I think that as much as I felt it, you know, as a human being, I don't know if I truly, truly got it until I had a child and I had, you know, watched my kids first. And I can tell you, you know, I'm married, but the idea that I wouldn't be with my child in the birthday morning, for an example, would just be really, really hard. And I don't, you know, and obviously I would survive it and I would try to take solace in the fact that my child is now, you know, with her father and that's okay. But it, it, it definitely made a difference. Like when I had a child, it made a difference. And, you know, my kids are, you know, they're young, but they're a little older than, you know, when it was babies. But I think about like when they were babies, it was, you know, I wanted to see every single thing that ever happened. And the idea that, you know, when I had a client that, maybe hated their ex-spouse or thought they were a bad parent or whatever it is, and or they were nervous about the parenting skills of the other spouse, I can understand. I mean, it would kill me, the idea to have my children be with somebody who I didn't trust. Um, you know, that's hard. That's very, very hard. And now I think I just have a, a different level. Uh, I can relate to my clients on a different level than I did before I had kids. Well, um, I agree that it's 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 going to be highly emotional no matter what. But whatever we can do to to minimize it, and and I think all of us are going to look inward. You know, even as an investigator, I mean, I'm looking inward as to uh, you know how I would feel in this situation or how I would think my children would feel. Um, we have a message that's coming in from a listener, and again, I want to thank those that take the time to do this. Many of which are teachers. Uh, that are working during the day or people or anyone that's working during the day uh, that sends in a message uh, early and then says, we're going to wait and listen later on at iTunes or whatever. So this one reads, um, my dad had made uh, my husband a partner in our agricultural business a couple of years after we were married. Four years ago, my dad unexpectedly died from a heart attack. It wasn't three months after the funeral that my husband filed for divorce and demanded that he be cashed out of his third of the estate. Uh, my brother and I were forced to liquidate almost half of the land uh, that had been in our family for a hundred years to pay him off and reorganize. I am writing this comment because people need to take the protection of their assets seriously. Divorce can be devastating uh, if you are not prepared. Uh, it can be devastating if you're not prepared. I am buying. Uh, I am buying this book for a friend who is just in the beginning of a divorce because she really needs to have a resource for what lies ahead. And this is from Julia in Washington. Well, I mean, that's a terrible story by far. And, you know, thank you very much for writing and and thank you for buying the book. I, you know, I absolutely agree. I think it is really important to do what you can to protect your assets, especially family assets. I mean, you know, having land in your family for a hundred years and then having to give it to an ex-spouse. I I mean, again, that must be very, very hard. And especially being that, you know, it sounds like her father was just, you know, trying to be generous to his daughter's husband. So, Yeah, I mean, but these things happen. And even, you know, even the idea of parents giving assets to 
you know, to the spouses of their children. You know, that's another thing that you just got to be a little bit careful about because while everyone is so well-intended, you know, if ultimately that spouse ends up not being the person you thought they were and you've given away assets that you don't want them to have, I mean, that's hard. You know, one of the things that we do, and I do speak about this in the book, is, you know, I do have a lot of prenuptial agreements and postnuptial agreements. And I think that they can be very valuable tools and to basically protect, you know, family assets more so and businesses and all sorts of things. You know, I happen to be, I know a lot of people see them to be as romantic or planning your divorce. Um, but I actually think if done well, they can actually strengthen your marriage, not to mention the fact that, you know, I think it's important. And I think especially when there's family assets, I think it's very important because, you know, there is something to be said for keeping some money in the bloodline. All right. We are talking with Jacqueline Newman. We're talking about her new book, New Rules of Divorce, 12 Secrets to Protect Your Wealth, Health, and Happiness. Stay with us. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Hi, I'm Marty Cove. You might remember me from my film roles such as the Sensei in the Karate Kid films and a variety of others. Uh, I've done over 100 films and countless stunts in my career, and I've always given 100% physically. As fun as it was, I've had to have multiple surgeries from doing some of my own stunts. With the damage done to my body over time, I needed to find relief from this chronic pain. My passion for health and fitness drove me to find a natural way to combat body and muscle pain without taking medication every day. Teaming up with doctors, detectives, and a compounding pharmacist, we created Marty's Cobra Cove Ultra Strength Pain Relief Cream. Our CBD cream is whole plant extracted and made with high-quality amino acids and essential oils that can improve the strength and the absorption. Other CBD's products, well, they aren't like ours. It's the only thing that has been strong enough to knock out my pain. And I'm not the only one. Thousands of... Other people have benefited from the healing attributes of these products worldwide. So check out our website at www.martyscobracove.com. It's legal, it's safe, and it's 100% effective. So show your pain, no mercy. And we're back. You're listening to Answers for Family. And we are talking with Jacqueline Newman in regards to her new book, New Rules of Divorce, 12 Secrets to Protecting Your Wealth, Health, and Happiness. But before we get back to that, we have, and I, it's always funny because I have trouble saying Jenny Meatballs. <laughs> it's, 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 it's Jenny Carrington. Thank you, Alan. And, uh, so, Jenny, uh, I, and I know that now this is what the third week in a row that you've called in. Uh, I want everybody to know that this is a young woman that is out there making a difference. And for those of you that have listened, you know that that I'm constantly talking about the fact that give your time, give your your eyes, give your ears to people that are out there making a positive difference, doing it in a very positive way. And that's exactly what Jenny is doing. Uh, She is walking across the country. So from the East Coast to the West Coast to make a positive difference. Uh, And she's doing it for her charity, which is Mother Earth. So with that, Jenny, tell everybody a little bit about it and where you're at, because I know we're getting close to the finish line. We are. Thank you, Alan, for having me on for the third week in a row. And for those of you who don't know, uh, just catching up, I actually, I I was about 2,500 miles into my walk when I first came on the show two weeks ago. And now I just hit my 2,700th mile yesterday. Um, And I am in Brawley, California. So I'm actually pretty close to the coast. Um, I am walking for my organization called We Are Mother Earth, and we are bringing educational zero carbon emission greenhouses to schools. So we are combating climate change with climate education, really bringing youth to climate action to the forefront of our uh, families and schools and communities because they're the ones who are going to have to inherit this planet So we want to make sure that they understand what's going on and are given the tools and the solutions now uh, to really solve some of the challenges of our time. Um, 
so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what's coming up. It's today, I think, is the 24th of February. And looking forward, um, we are going to be approaching uh, March 5th is when I will hit Oceanside, California. And between March 5th and my final date of my final arrival in Venice Beach on March 10th, we're going to be asking all you folks, all you listeners, and all of our fellow like-minded organizations who are doing humanitarian work to come join us in this March for Global Unity for the Earth. So we are, uh, I'm going to be walking up from Oceanside um, to Venice and uh, making stops in between and walking with any or all individuals or organizations who want to join in and join the march. Jenny, I got to tell you, I, I am so proud and, and I, I think I told you this, but I will share it with everybody. Um, when I met Jenny, uh, the feeling that came over me was we're going to be okay as a society because when there are young people like this making a difference, uh, that's how it makes me feel. Uh, I, I was listening to a story this morning, and I want to give credit where credit's due. It's called Darren Daly, uh, something I listen to in the morning. And he told a story that I think many of us have heard, but I think it fits. And it has to do with walking down the beach and a man seeing a child throwing starfish into the sea. And he looks down the beach and he sees that there are hundreds of thousands of starfish up and down the beach and he asks the girl what she's doing and she says i'm throwing them in because the high tide they'll die if we leave them up here and he said well you can't make a difference there's hundreds of thousands of these you'll never be able to get enough it won't make any difference and she looked up at him and said it'll make a difference to this one as she throws that one in that's the way that we have to be looking at things and and that's what i see in jenny and so many of the other young people out there that are making a huge difference. So for that, thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I just wanted to say real quickly, you know, a lot of people said that about Greta Thunberg, the young woman who was striking in Sweden, and she had her Fridays for Future climate strikes go worldwide within a year. So we're hoping to connect with Greta because Greta has put out the call to get kids back to school school and to stop worrying about the future of their planet. And we are answering that call by getting kids back to school in an educational zero carbon emission learning lab that addresses climate, the climate problems and gets kids engaged. So we believe that, you know, all of you out there listening can play a role. We all can take one small step. And that's the point of the earth walk is one small step toward a better future for our next seven generations. Well, again, Jenny, thank you so much. I look forward to you calling in next Monday and uh, you'll be close to the end, but we'll look forward to hearing where you're at and how things are going then. So again, thank you. Great. You're no problem. And anyone who just wants to follow real quick, you can um, text the number 64600 and in the message line, you'll write Mother Earth. That'll pull up our business card. You can check out our videos and website and follow the journey uh, by connecting with me through that. That's 64600. And in the subject line is Mother Earth. So thank you so much, Alan. You're welcome. All right. So I feel better already. So, uh, so Jacqueline, we, we have another uh, comment that is coming in, uh, has come in. And this one reads... Uh, children are many times used as weapons when a divorce turns nasty over money. I was one of those kids when my father, in parentheses, who was also an attorney, uh, filed for the divorce and convinced the courts my mom was an unfit mother. Uh, she was suffering from depression, uh, uh, primarily from the way in which my father had emotionally abused her. I was only nine at the time when he was awarded full custody. After I turned 18, uh, I was able to go live with my mom and help her pull her life together uh, and help her regain her health. Uh, I am very much looking forward to reading your book as I am currently applying for law school and would like to follow in the path of attorneys such as yourself. And this is Craig in Los Angeles. Oh, well, that's very nice. Thank you for the kind words. Um, yeah, I mean, he's right. People do very often use their children as weapons, and it's awful. I mean, it is such a terrible, terrible thing to do to your child. It's actually 
you know, one of the reasons that I got into this field was that I wanted to be in a position to hopefully influence parents who thought they, you know, weren't, who weren't aware of how much damage they were doing to their children um, by involving them, you know, and especially, you know, when you have children that are maybe teenagers, a lot of times parents feel like, oh, they're old enough to handle it. And you know what? No child, I don't care how old you are, is ever going to be old enough to handle the idea that their parents are at war. I mean, even adult children, they suffer from this when you're dealing with what we call great divorces, which are, you know, people getting divorced in their older ages. And so I, I can't emphasize enough how awful it is to do to your children. I think that people think that if they're, you know, everybody's hurt. And so it's a natural inclination when you're, you know, on the schoolyard and you get in a fight with someone, you want to gang all your friends together to everybody hate that person because that's what people do and they shouldn't. And when it's your children, you know, and again, I do talk about this in the book also about how, you know, you don't want to put on your like, I hate mom or I hate dad t-shirts on your kids. Like, it's just a terrible thing to do. It's not fair to your children. It causes enormous anxiety in your children. And, you know, again, the real goal for you, this kind of goes back to what I said earlier, the goal for you is to raise happy, healthy children that feel safe. And the best way they're going to feel safe is for you to say to them, mommy and daddy love you. And you're our number one priority. And we're going to do everything we can to make you happy and safe and, and healthy. And so, you know, to anyone who thinks that their children don't understand or don't pick up on tones or don't pick up on word choice or aren't listening, they're listening. And it's really important that you kind of just keep them out of it. You know, I, I appreciate your analogy of uh, the schoolyard because the thought that went through my mind when you said that was, and guess what, parents? We're supposed to be adults, okay? <laughs> so so exactly. when you gave that analogy, I think that was perfect. So, you know, grow up be the adult and keep in mind what's best for your children. Now you also write in the book uh, while we're talking about children that children sometimes are better off with divorced parents uh, than parents who fight with each other all the time. Uh, explain a little bit more about that. Sure. So, you know, there, I feel like you could do, you could look outside, you could find a study that would basically say that children, you know, obviously are better for children to be raised by two parents than one. You're going to find tons of studies that are going to say that. But you can now also find a lot of studies that say, you know what, children that are raised in families that, first of all, if there's any kind of abuse, physical or, you know, emotional, that in itself is a terrible environment for your children to be raised because what they're doing is they're basically learning how to, how to treat someone. And there's a cycle of abuse. And I do have a whole chapter that talks about abuse. But even when there's not overt abuse, even when it's just a loveless marriage or people are just kind of ignoring each other, but, you know, just going through the emotion, I say the business of raising children, and there's just, there's no love there. Again, that's an example of what your children think marriage should be. Like they think that marriage should be just everybody kind of working in the business and they're not being affection. They're not being any intimacy. They're not, you know, they're watching that. And so, you know, there's lots of studies and a lot of times people are just angry, you know, and the other thing is you're watching two parents be unhappy. And is it good for kids to be growing up in an atmosphere where, yes, they're both under the same roof, but you've got two unhappy people under the same roof, as opposed to being under different roofs and being in a situation where they're actually happy and open to being possibly in other relationships where they can model what an actual happy, healthy relationship is. So I do think that there's a lot, there can be benefits to divorce. I think also, you know, what happens very often is that if you have one parent who's a primary caretaker and the other parent, you know, and I'm going to be stereotypical just for the moment because it's a little bit easier in description. But if you have, let's say the mom is a you know, stay-at-home mom who's, you know, very dedicated to the daily caretaking of the children. You have a father who maybe works a ton you know, loves his kids, spends a lot of time with his kids when he can, but he's not around as much. And what ends up happening is that a lot of times in those typical situations, you have fathers who sometimes don't connect as well with their children, partially because when they're all sitting at the dinner table, mom's talking about what went on the day. She's talking about all the things that the kids can relate to. And dad kind of gets left out a little bit. And maybe he doesn't ask as many questions, or maybe when he does, the kids are like, oh, I already explained that or whatever it is. So what ends up happening sometimes in the divorce, and I find it very interesting when I represent the mom clients who are like, although he knows nothing about them, or even the dad clients who say, I don't know enough about them, is that they learn to be really good parents. Not that they weren't before, but they really learn to connect with their kids because now you don't have mom as that buffer. Now you have to sit across the table with your child and actually have a conversation just with your child and ask him or her about 
everything was going on. You know, why did you and your boyfriend break up? What's going on with your friends? Why are you struggling in school? What's going on? What makes you, you know, why did you love that movie? Like they have to sit and have these conversations that they probably didn't have to have as much because you had the other person as the buffer. And so I say a lot that, you know, I know you're concerned that, you know, your spouse doesn't know what, you know, your kid's favorite crayon color is or, you know, what's going to be the song that's going to calm them, but they're going to learn. And when they learn, they're going to be such better parents for it. And your children could be better for it because they're going to have true connections with both their parents. And so I think that, you know, and I don't want to idealize this and say, oh, everything's going to be great. But I do think that there are a lot of situations that can occur from a divorce that can actually strengthen your child's relationship with both parents, strengthen your child as a whole, even though your the child's going to be growing up a divorced parent. That was beautiful. And I'm going to add now, as speaking directly to the audience, uh, when I suggested that you play a particular paragraph or a particular statement to everybody, you know, add that one to it also. Okay, because that is that is the type of thing that they need to hear. It is going to help them immensely for the rest of their life. Uh, so again, Jacqueline, thank you for that. Uh, now, um, some other thoughts, because we're talking about certain types of divorces, but I know that you also get involved in some of the celebrity or public figure types. So what's the difference between when your client is a celebrity or a public figure uh, and someone who's not necessarily in the public eye? So what happens when somebody's in the public in the public space is that or public eye is that, first of all, there's an extra layer. So a lot of times, and, you know, it depends if both par- parties are. If both parties are in the public side, and there's a little bit of an even playing field. But very often you'll have one person who, you know, let's say you have an actor who's married to someone who's not in the public eye. And so what ends up happening is that if you're representing, or either one, it doesn't matter who you're representing, there's this extra level of threat because, you know, a person's career can be, you know, can basically hang in the thread of what people think of them. And so if you, you know, basically someone comes out and they you know, claim to be a deadbeat dad kind of thing, that can impact the way movie ratings can go. I mean, people are really very, very sensitive to their reputation. Um, and so you've got to be careful about that. And so you have to make sure you don't show up on, you know, page six, which is our, you know, New York, the New York magazine, the New York, uh, you know, publicity page in one of our local uh, papers. But you want to really make sure that, you know, you want to control the public image. So that's one thing. You know, and I've also represented people that are, you know, you know, CEOs of public companies. And so when you're in that sort of situation, you also have to be careful that, you know, information doesn't leak out and things are handled properly because that can affect stock prices. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things that deal with all of this that you just have to be careful about what gets leaked and what doesn't. Um, you know, so there's, you know, you deal with a lot of agents, you deal with a lot of PR people, you'll deal with everybody of like to have a universal message. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, sometimes when you're dealing with people that, you know, again, are in the public eyes or have like big teams around them, you know, it's interesting. And we also deal with a lot of uh, athletes and, you know, they have big teams around them and they have people that, you know, everybody's whispering in their ears. And as much as, you know, people are coming from a good place, sometimes they're giving really bad advice. And so that can be very, very challenging. But that happens, you know, that can happen with, you know, your Aunt Mabel also giving you good yeah. advice of like, <laughs> You know, what happened to her brother's cousin's sister's brother's aunt, you know? Yes. So that's always, you know, and I do talk about that in the book a little bit about how, you know, ignore the hairdresser with the PhD. Like, I think it's important that, you know, people, you know, as much as as well intended as so many people are, you need to be careful about who's buzzing in your ear. Uh, you know, I talk to, I always say, like, if your mother's giving you a hard time or your, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever it is, have them call me. Like, I would much rather sit and explain to them the reason that it's really a bad idea to never let yourself see the kids or whatever it might be, because I want to explain to them how that actually could backfire against you. And so sometimes when I have that conversation, it like leaves the dinner table a little bit more comfortable for my client. Yeah. And I think one of the problems with it, things getting into the media is that when it's something that's ugly, it gets, uh, it's a headline, it's front page, And then even if later on it's determined that it was uh, inaccurate or exaggerated or just a flat out lie, that ends up as a byline on page 17. So people remember that headline and they don't read it deep enough to find out that it actually wasn't true. And that's one of the saddest things about it. Right. Well, I actually had a case that this was a really tough situation where, and not to get a jumble, but, you know, I represent the husband, the wife made a motion and said all these awful things about him in this motion. And because she didn't, she failed to state a claim, like even no matter how many bad things she said about him, 
it wasn't a legal claim that raised, so we made a motion for what's called summary judgment. And in a motion for summary judgment, you say, let's even say everything you say is true. You still don't make enough of a legal argument to move forward in the case. So when we did this, this ended up ended up being a published case, unfortunately, for my client, because we had to assume everything was true. So we never wrote something saying that we ended up winning the case, but from a, you know, from a public media standpoint, it looks very bad for him because we didn't deny any of these things. But legally, we couldn't have denied it because once you deny it, then there's a fact that would be ultimately a fact finding hearing. And so then you have to go to see a judge. And we were saying, you know what, it doesn't even matter if it's all true. Not that it is true, but it wouldn't matter if it was. But it leaked into the press. And it was one of those things where, you know, it looked awful for our guy from a press perspective. I mean, it was great from a legal standpoint to the point we won our motion, but it was terrible because, you know, they're like, well, obviously he didn't even deny it, so it must be true. And, you know, the, the papers aren't going to get into the legal reasons why you can't deny so um, it is, you know, this is the kind of stuff that happens. Well, before we run out of, of time, um, while we're talking about this, some of these uh, high net worth, um, what's the most bizarre thing that you've seen two people of high net worth decided that they were going to fight over? Uh, you know, it, it's interesting. It, it doesn't, you know, the, the assets that people fight over, you know, high net worth or not, a lot of times isn't about the asset. You know, most of the time it's really about what, you know, what the symbolic meaning of it is, whether it's the symbolic meaning being that I want to punish the other person so much or the symbolic meaning is like what it means. Like I've had clients that have thought about the silliest things, like to the degree that, you know, one of my, I call it my favorite case, even though it's not really a favorite case. But I had a client once who, I mean, it was a multi-million dollar case. And I do talk about this case in the book. And he wanted the grandfather clock he wanted to it was like he settled everything in this case and i mean again it took like probably a year to basically settle this case and it was over 20 million dollars in assets in the case and ultimately it came down to this you know 800 dollar grandfather clock and the only reason he wanted it is because the wife wanted it mm-hmm. and he was willing to throw the entire case over and what he wanted to do was light it on fire take a video of it and send it to her. Like that's all he wanted to do. Oh. And all he really almost threw away the entire case. At the end of the day, you know, we got him the grandfather clock and whether he ultimately burnt it or not, I don't know. I'm <laughs> guessing he probably did. But that was the kind of thing where he would have thrown away an entire case and spent, you know, probably $100,000 more in legal fees on it all because of the vengeance of the grandfather clock. And it happened. <laughs> well, um, Jacqueline, thank you so much for taking your time. And, and more importantly, thank you for approaching this subject uh, at a level of integrity that I wish that everybody did because I think we'd have a lot more happier people out there. So uh, I want to acknowledge you for that. Thank, thank you. you for that. And again, so for everybody out there, uh, I know that the website would be um, uh, nycdivorcelawyer.com. Uh, is there any other way in which they could contact you or to get the book? Sure. So the book you can get on Amazon. It's The New Rules of Divorce, 12 Secrets to Protecting Your Wealth, Health, and Happiness. And then, you know, I could also be reached at my firm website, which is berkbot.com, B as in boy, E-R-K, B as in boy, O, T as in Tom, dot com. All right. So again, Jacqueline, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. And for everybody out there, please be sure to put us on your calendar and tune in next Monday when we will be joined by our special guest, Marnie Jamison, to discuss her new book, Downsizing the Blended Home, When Two Households Become One. It's a special book to help those who are merging their hearts, their lives, and their homes. Now, please visit our archives of past interviews at AnswersForTheFamily.com, where you can subscribe to our show through iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Spreaker, SoundCloud, and iHeartRadio. If you like what you hear, please leave a review. It will help us reach more people, and we greatly appreciate it. The next time you are on Facebook or Twitter, please remember to stop by our page. Check out some of our latest posts. If you like them, please like us and spread the word. For everybody out there, please be good human beings and be with us again next week on Answers for the Family. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza right here on L.A. Talk Radio.